Dad Texas, The Journey West. Written by Derek Slayton. Narrated by P.J. Morgan. Chapter One. Sparks winced at every gunshot faintly emanating from the earpiece on the floor. Each one of those shots claiming the life of an innocent member of Principal Dan's group, the group she had worked so hard to protect. She took a deep breath and lifted the earpiece with a trembling hand. She slipped it back on as she clenched her jaw. However painful, she needed as much information as she could get. Sir, a male voice. There's a fire at the supply trucks. Kill everyone and do whatever you have to do to save those supplies. Elijah barked orders in the distance. Sir, it's all gone, another voice said with reluctance. God damn it, Elijah screamed in frustration, and the gunfire died away in the background. All right, let's regroup at the farmhouse. There was the sound of a door slamming, and then silence. When Sparks was sure that there was to be no more intel, she tore the earpiece from her head and threw it across the room. Anger pulsed through her veins like napalm, and she wiped away the last tear she was willing to shed because of these assholes. She tossed the canvas bag of meds over her shoulder before doing a sweep of the house. She nabbed a few handgun mags from the dead militia members and two handguns. Her eyes locked on a pump-action shotgun on the kitchen counter next to a set of keys. Not really ideal. She picked up the large weapon and turned it over in her hands but it'll do. She came upon a large storeroom full of food and water and stuffed her bag full before returning to the living room. Zombies stood on the front porch, banging on the door, and she carefully peeked out the window off to the side. There were a dozen or so clustered there, and past them no vehicles that the keys could belong to. A zombified militia member suddenly struck the glass with its face, gnawing at the window. She gave it the finger before moving to the back of the house. The back porch was clear, with no movement in the backyard that she could tell through the window. There was a pickup truck about 10 feet from the door, and she drew her handgun. A thought niggled in the back of her brain just before she exited, and she turned to face the storeroom of supplies that Elijah and his surviving men were coming back to enjoy. She holstered her weapon and rummaged through the kitchen cupboards. She set a bottle of whiskey on the counter and shoved a rag down the top of it. She carefully stowed it in the side pocket of her bag before heading back to the front of the house. She yelled and banged on the front door. Originally, she just wanted to rile up the front porch zombies, but she drew on every ounce of her pain and frustration and sadness and injected it into the primal scream escaping her body. It was cathartic, popping the cap on the shaken up bottle of tension in her guts. Once finished, she stalked to the back door again, feeling lighter and ready for action as she drew her gun. She gently opened it, slipping outside with the keys at the ready and running to the truck. She unlocked the vehicle and grabbed the bottle from her bag before tossing it into the passenger's seat. She clambered up into the driver's seat and closed the door behind her as silently as she could. She slid the key into the ignition and then set her gun on the dashboard before lighting the Molotov in her hand. She turned the key, wanting to make damn sure that her only means of escape worked before burning down her only shelter. It purred to life, and she smiled thinly. She hung her hand out the open window of the truck and chucked it through the back door of the farmhouse. It shattered in the hallway, coating the walls in liquid flame. She punched the gas and sped around the house, the zombies oblivious to her escape. The flickering flames consumed the house quickly and faded into the rearview mirror. The white-hot rage within sparks, however, remained. Chapter Two What do you think? Jeff asked Rufus, the two leaning over the roof of the truck. All was quiet on the streets as they squinted in the darkness of the interstate exit ramp. The older man inclined his head. I'm thinking that gas station across the street probably has a bathroom. Good to know you're focused on the important things. The skinhead rolled his eyes. Rufus shrugged. 
spoken like a man who's never had to dig his own hole to take a shit in. Just be sure you check under the stall door before you go busting in, Jeff warned. Good call, his companion agreed. What do you think, boys, we good? Mary called through the back window. Yeah, head over to the gas station, Jeff instructed. Ricky put the truck in drive. You got it, he confirmed. He bumbled slowly across the way into the gas station parking lot. There were a few dead bodies scattered about, all of them missing the backs of their heads. Their clothes were tattered and encrusted in blood, so it was clear that the head wounds were the killing blow in their second undead life. As soon as he pulled up to the pumps, the two passengers in the back jumped down to the concrete. You two stay in the cab until we check the building out, Rufus instructed. If you see us running, you'll be ready to punch it. Ricky nodded. I got your back, Bubba. You take point, Jeff said, and the older man led the way to the convenience store. I'll sweep the aisles, he said, and you make sure nothing comes at me from behind the register or the back room. The skinhead nodded. All right, let's do it. He pulled the small door open, and Rufus burst in, assault rifle at the ready. He swiftly moved through the front of the store, aiming down each of the four short aisles. Jeff followed in and jumped behind the counter, finding nothing. Clear, Rufus called from the back. Same here, the skinhead replied. There was a sudden banging from the back of the store that startled them both. They cautiously met at the back hallway towards the storage room, only to find it heavily barricaded. Rufus reached forward and tapped on the door, and a ruckus erupted from the other side. Well, that got him all riled up, he said. Jeff yanked on the barricade a bit and shrugged. It's solid. Doesn't sound like there are enough of them to get through. Well, I tend to agree. You mind keeping an eye on it while I conduct an air raid? Rufus smirked. Just as Jeff opened his mouth to reply, the store filled with flashing red and blue lights. What the hell is that? Whatever it is, we're gonna be ready for it, the older man replied, raising his rifle. Jeff nodded. Let's get out there. Nah, you stay in here, Rufus said with a shake of his head. If things get squirrely, it'd be good to have an ace in the hole. I'll be ready, his companion replied. The older man exited the store, holding the gun casually, but with his finger discreetly on the trigger. There was a fully uniformed police officer standing behind the open door of a cruiser, lights flashing. Whoa, that's far enough right there, the officer barked. Rufus continued his stroll over to the truck, leaning up against the bed. He was happy to see that Ricky and Mary were still inside the cab. What seems to be the trouble, officer? Y'all are in a heap of trouble breaking into the gas station like that. He snapped, but his voice trembled with false bravado. The older man estimated him to be in his early 20s and wondered how fresh out of the academy he'd been when shit went south. Rufus laughed. It's a motherfucking apocalypse, and you're worried about breaking and entering? What kind of dumbass are you, boy? Look, the law's the law, and I'm here to enforce it, the officer said and swallowed hard. So I'm gonna have to ask y'all to come with me. Zombies running wild, and you want to take us to jail for fighting to survive? Rufus narrowed his eyes. Not gonna take you to jail, the officer shook his head. The sheriff has set up a shelter in Junction, so I'm gonna take you there and let him decide what to do with you. There was a click as Jeff stepped out of the shadows behind the cruiser. Is this really a fight you want to have? The officer whipped around with his gun drawn prompting both of his opponents to aim at him. Easy, buddy, Jeff warned. I don't want to put you down, but you wouldn't be the first today. All right, the officer holstered his gun slowly. Now let's just take it down a beat, guys. Oh, we're down, bud, Rufus replied. How about we do this? He raised his hands beside his head. Why don't you guys follow me to the shelter, and I'll tell the sheriff you flagged me down. Then we're all good. Well, it's gonna be a while before we can do that, Jeff replied. We have some friends coming to meet us, and they're a few hours out. Some friends, huh? The officer raised an eyebrow. How many? 
A few dozen or so, Rufus said. I don't know if we're gonna have the supplies to accommodate that many. Don't worry, we're self-sufficient, Jeff explained. Outside of gas, of course. Well, hell, bud, why didn't you say so? The officer asked and reached into his pocket, producing a set of keys. Here, I've got the key to unlock the pump so you can get filled up. I'm Deputy Carter of the Junction PD. Jeff gripped his gun tightly, on high alert. I'm Jeff, that's Rufus, he introduced carefully. The young couple in the truck are Ricky and Mary. Nice to meet you all, Carter replied brightly and headed over to the pump. Here, let me get the gas going for you. You want the high test there, bud? Uh, yeah, Ricky replied, brow furrowed. That'll work. All right, coming right up, the deputy exclaimed as he opened the gas tank. Jeff waved Rufus over to him. Is it just me, or did he get suspiciously friendly when I mentioned we were bringing food? He asked quietly. Why couldn't this sumbitch be in my weekly card game? Rufus replied in a low voice. With a poker face like that, I could have been driving a Camaro by now. You think we should take him out? Jeff wondered. Nah, the older man replied with a shake of his head. He may be a dipshit, but I don't think he's lying about the sheriff and the shelter. Don't know about you, but I've had my fill of armed confrontations for the day. All right, the skinhead said, but he doesn't leave our sight. This motherfucker doesn't get a moment of privacy. If he's not on the up and up, the last thing we need are his friends showing up. Agreed. There you go, that'll be 2750. Carter replaced the gas pump and locked it. Ha ha, just messing with you. Ricky and Mary shared an unamused glance. So you know, if you don't want to sit out here, I can run you up to the shelter and send some of my boys back to meet your friends. The deputy offered, leaning his elbow on the driver's side window. I mean, no sense in y'all spending the night outside when you can be nice and comfy, right? If it's all the same, deputy, I think we're gonna stay right here and wait for our friends, Jeff piped up. Well, all right then, Carter said, shrugging his shoulders. His eyes darted around as he stepped back from the truck. I guess I can hang out with you. Hey, any of you want some coffee? I stashed a bag behind the front counter. I can brew us some. Jeff nodded. Sure, let me give you a hand. Oh no, I gotcha. Carter waved his hands in front of his face. Please, I insist, the skinhead replied with a grin. You're kind enough to take us to the shelter. The least I can do is help out. The deputy's big smile faltered. All right then, you get the water and I'll get the beans. I'll bring Ricky and Mary up to speed, Rufus assured his companion as he followed after the mysterious officer. Oh, Rufus, how do you take your coffee? Jeff called over his shoulder as they walked. Like I take my women, the older man called back. Cold and bitter, Jeff chuckled. And here I was thinking you prefer them Irish. Ah, you convinced me, Rufus laughed. I'll take it Irish. I'll see what I can do, the skinhead replied as he opened the door for the deputy. Chapter three. Sparks pulled off the interstate slowly as she approached the off-ramp. The combination of sleep deprivation and self-loathing had her in a bit of a daze. How the hell am I going to explain this to the others? Everybody is gone because I fucked up. Oh God, what if the others didn't make it either? She shook her head violently from side to side, as if to shake away her demons. Jesus Christ, girl, snap out of it. She crested the hill of the ramp and nearly burst into relieved tears at the sight of her four friends clustered around the back of Ricky's truck with a police officer. She pulled into the parking lot, and before she could even get out of the car, Rufus was right there. Goddamn, girl, even when you look like hell, you still look amazing. He shot her a lopsided grin. Bet you have some stories to tell. She let out a small, bewildered laugh before burying her face in his chest. Ah, oh, come on now, Rufus squeezed her in a hug. It wasn't that bad of a compliment. I'm sorry, she murmured into his chest. It, it was just a rough night. Don't worry about it, girl, he replied and rubbed her back in slow circles. 
We had a hell of a time, too. Ma'am, I'm Deputy Carter. The officer strolled up, and the redhead straightened up, turning to face him with squared shoulders. Officer Sparks of the Austin PD. Oh, an officer, huh? Carter replied. Good to know. He nodded, but she was already walking past him towards the tailgate. Everybody, I, I have news, she said, clasping her hands in front of her. Last night, I had an encounter with Elijah. Rufus stepped up beside her, eyes blazing. That motherfucker, did he hurt you? No, she replied, shaking her head. He tried, but no. He did get my belongings, though, including the GPS and my earpiece. Mary burst into tears, and Ricky wrapped his arms around her shoulders tightly. How bad is it? Jeff asked. I haven't been able to reach them all morning. There, Spark swallowed hard. They're all gone. Ricky folded his wife into his chest, glaring at the redhead. How do you know? He asked, wiping furiously at his eyes. I got my earpiece back and talked to Dan just as Elijah showed up, Sparks explained, eyes downcast. Rufus put an arm around her shoulders, giving her a reassuring squeeze. All I heard were gunshots and Dan telling me it was okay. There was apparently a fire in the supplies, too. Carter stepped forward, rejoining the group. So there's no food coming? Sparks tore away from Rufus and whirled on the deputy, eyes blazing as she stood nose to nose with him. That's your fucking takeaway from what I just said? His mouth opened and closed like a fish out of water. I, uh. My fuck up killed our entire group, and all you care about is the food, she demanded. The deputy stepped back, eyes wide. Ma'am, I'm very sorry for your loss, he stammered. And I'm even sorrier for my response. It's just, we have a lot of people at the shelter, and the supplies aren't that plentiful. The redhead turned away from him, addressing her friends. This is something that is going to haunt me for the rest of my days, she admitted. It's my fault that Elijah got a hold of the GPS, and it's... It's my fault that Principal Dan and the others are gone. It's my fault. She took in a deep, ragged breath, and Rufus put his hands on her shoulders again. Girl, you listen to me, and you listen good, he demanded. You ain't to blame for what that bastard Elijah did. Hell, if you want to blame somebody, then you need to be blaming me. Rufus, her voice cracked as she looked up at him. I appreciate the sentiment, but you aren't the one who lost the GPS that led them back to the camp. No, but I am the one who missed an open shot on the sumbitch when I had it, he replied. If I didn't fuck that up, then he wouldn't have been a problem for you, because dead men don't walk. She raised an eyebrow. Granted, that saying carried a lot more weight a week ago, he said. But damn, girl, you get my point. I do, Rufus, she said leaning her head against his shoulder, and thanks. He squeezed her shoulder, anytime, girl. Carter stepped back into the group. Y'all, I'm sorry to interrupt again, he said, raising his hands. But if nobody else is coming, we really should get up to the shelter. There's a lot going on in town, and I really need to get you back. Dude, Jeff snapped. Can you give us a moment here to mourn? It's all right, Jeff, he's right. We can't just sit around here all day, Sparks cut in. Deputy, I'm gonna grab a cup of that coffee and gas up the truck here, then we can be on our way. I'll take care of the truck, Rufus told her. You take care of you. Carter nodded. All right, I'll call it in and let them know we're on the way. Chapter four. A Camaro, huh? Sparks raised an eyebrow as she took up the rear of their interstate convoy. You think his poker face was that bad? Rufus nodded. I swear if that goober got pocket aces, his face would look like a porn star crawled under the table and- I get the gist, she replied, putting up a hand. Rufus grinned. So would he. Did you set out to be a dirty old man or did it just come naturally? Sparks couldn't help but share his contagious grin. 100% God-given ability, 
He puffed his chest out. Good to see that God was generous at one point in time. The redhead snorted and shook her head. Amen to that. So, were you guys able to figure out what Carter was hiding? She asked. Nah, he shook his head. We threw some questions his way, but couldn't get a full read on him. All we got was that he was really eager to get us to the shelter, and way, way too interested in the supplies we were bringing in. Yeah, I caught that part, she agreed. Motherfucker is lucky I didn't deck him. God knows the little prick would have deserved it, Rufus added. Sparks raised an eyebrow. So you got any theories? Maybe they're like those militia douchebags and they're stockpiling supplies, he shrugged. But that wouldn't explain why they're keeping people alive in the shelter. Assuming that part is true, she suggested. You know, Rufus sighed. We really need to find an optimist to add to the group. It would be refreshing to go into a situation and hear how wonderful it's gonna be. I agree, it would be nice to have a laugh at that absurdity before we rush into certain doom, she laughed. Well, I know a few jokes from my military days, he said, and put his finger to his chin for effect. Pretty sure if I think hard enough, I can remember one that wasn't entirely racist or sexist. Sparks rolled her eyes. Only one? What do you want? Rufus shrugged. It was the 60s. The only time we heard someone say PC was when it was followed up by a P and do you have any? She laughed. Simpler times, huh? Carter flashed his lights and briefly flipped his siren, signaling to two cruisers that were manning their exit. They led the convoy through, and Sparks and Rufus eyed up the two police officers as they left the interstate. There were two gas stations on either side of the road, guarded by several patrol cars. On the far end, cruisers blocked the road coming from the other direction. Man, they've got this shit on lockdown, Sparks commented. Rufus nodded. Definitely a step up from the last shit show we were in. Carter led them down the road and a few blocks into the small town. There were officers everywhere, blocking off all the exits to town centered around a large church auditorium. Beside the building was a commercial grade transport bus with a few people loading up the bottom compartments with supplies. Carter parked next to the bus, waving the two trucks in next to him. Jeff jumped down from the bed of Ricky's truck, approaching the greeting officer as his four companions exited their vehicles. Sorry, folks, I'm gonna have to ask you to turn over your weapons, the officer declared. Rufus fell in line next to Jeff, the two of them gripping their rifles. And I'm gonna have to ask you to fuck right on off. The officer's shoulders tensed, and Sparks stepped in front of her men. Sir, my name is Lacey Sparks, and I'm an officer with the Austin PD, she said. These are my deputies who have saved my life on multiple occasions since this thing started. They're legally authorized to carry. Be that as it may, the officer replied. If you want to come into this rescue shelter, you're going to have to disarm. Jeff shrugged. Well, looks like we're going to be on our way then. Just be sure you head east on the interstate, the officer replied. The North has blocked off to traffic, and you don't have permission to go west. Oh, really? Jeff clenched his jaw, stepping forward. I wasn't aware that a small town police officer had the ability to shut down the goddamn interstate. His opponent's eyes were like ice. Well, we do, and it is. Bullshit, the skinhead snapped. Come on, y'all, we're gassed up. I say we blow this joint and continue on our journey west. Officer Limp Dick here ain't gonna do shit. He flashed their opponent his middle finger and turned to head back to the truck. Let me show you what happens if you do. The officer snarled and pulled his baton. Sparks immediately lashed out, landing a kidney punch from the side, catching his baton arm as it dropped and slamming his head onto the hood of the truck. Rufus pressed the barrel of his handgun into the now subdued officer's temple, leaning down to look him in the eye. And what would that be exactly? My, 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 what do we have here? A stern voice asked, and the group turned at the approach of a tall man with a full dark beard. Your boy here broke free of his leash, Rufus explained. 
so my girl and I was taking precautions in case he turned rabid. Officer Sams, were you misbehaving? The bearded officer asked, a touch of disdain in his voice. Just, Sparks' captive hissed, and she didn't let up on his arm behind his back. Just protecting the route like you ordered, Sheriff. Well, it would appear as though you came on a little strong there, son. The sheriff clucked his tongue. Yes, sir, Sams gasped. His leader crossed his arms. Would you like to apologize to these fine folks? I, I, the officer grunted. I'm sorry. So, the sheriff addressed Sparks. Now that my officer has made amends, would you be willing to release him? You have my permission to put him down if he acts out again. She and Rufus shared a glance and a nod, and the redhead let the rogue officer go. He rubbed his arm and slunk away to his post, red-faced. Folks, let me introduce you to Sheriff Hutch, Carter declared. Pleased to make your acquaintance, the sheriff greeted. Why don't you all follow me inside, and I'll give you the lay of the land. He led the newcomers into the shelter, and they strolled after him, Jeff and Rufus still holding their rifles in step with sparks. On the far end, there was a lone basketball hoop where a few teenagers played. Several families were huddled together around large wooden tables, a few random groups of people scattered about, eating snacks and making small talk. This is our temporary rescue shelter for travelers such as yourself, Hutch said. Temporary? Mary piped up. That's right, ma'am. He tipped his hat to her. Junction has long been the final stop before people headed towards El Paso, as there's not a whole lot for a couple hundred miles. While this makes it a great place to gas up, it's not an ideal spot to house survivors. So where are you taking them? Ricky asked. There's a little town about 50 miles up the road called Sonora, the sheriff replied. My brother is the sheriff up there, so when all this started to go down, we partnered up. I'm guessing it's secure, Jeff asked. About as secure as any place can be, given the situation. Hutch grasped his large belt buckle with his bare hand. We're the closest major town to it, so it's pretty isolated. And my brother did a good job forming a posse and getting it locked down, so those undead creatures have been eradicated. Mary raised a delicate hand. How many people have you relocated? Over the past couple of days, we've been moving the citizens of Junction out there, Hutch replied. So when you factor in the random survivors who stopped in, I'm guessing five, maybe six hundred have found their way to Sonora. How are you doing on supplies? Sparks piped up. Your deputy there seemed real upset when he heard we weren't bringing in the truckloads of food like originally intended. I'll level with you, it's not good, the sheriff admitted. Even when we combine the resources of Junction and Sonora, we barely have enough food and water to provide for that number of people for longer than a few weeks. My brother is sending out scouts and hunters to secure everything they can, but it remains to be seen just how successful they're gonna be. Carter jogged to the front of the group. Sheriff, tell them about the truck. Settle down, deputy. Hutch narrowed his eyes. I'm getting to it. Sparks crossed her arms. The truck? Most of the people in this room came in on that giant tour bus that's being loaded up, Hutch said. They were just outside of Austin when things went to shit, and they got forced into the back roads. The driver informed me that about 10 miles up the road, they saw a big rig for one of those giant supercenter stores that had landed in a ditch. It was dinged up, but still looked drivable if we could figure out a way to get it back on the road. Problem is, we sent a scout to check it out, and he said there were a dozen or so zombies surrounding it. Apparently, the driver was still alive when it wrecked, and that held their attention. Rufus's brow furrowed. Then why haven't you gone and gotten it yet? Because we're spread pretty thin here, Hutch replied. Half of my officers have already moved up to Sonora to secure things, so I'm on a skeleton crew here. I have a mechanic, driver, and tow truck operator, but they ain't exactly keen to get into a conflict with those things. So I was wondering, if we could ride up there and lay the smack down on some zombies for you? Ricky finished. I was hoping to put it a little more eloquently, but in a nutshell, yes, the sheriff admitted. Sparks put a hand on her hip. 
All right, we'll do it, but we're gonna need some ammo. Of course, Hutch replied with a firm nod. Deputy Carter will take you by the armory on the way out and get you whatever you need. And I know I don't have a lot to offer you, but when you get to Sonora, I can get you all some prime housing. Hell, I'll even talk to my brother and see if I can't get you a choice security gig. Sparks put up a hand. That's appreciated, but one step at a time. She turned to her companions. We've got some zombies to kill first. Chapter Five Sparks and Ricky drove their respective trucks towards the big rig just outside of town, following Deputy Carter in his cruiser once again. He slowed down to a stop, about a quarter mile away from the zombie horde, close enough to see them, but far enough away that they weren't alerted. Well, there it is, Carter said as they disembarked from their vehicles. Looks like they've attracted a few more of those ghouls. Rufus and Spark stepped forward, looking through binoculars they'd nabbed from the police armory. This looks like fun, the older man said. The redhead shrugged. Eh, we faced worse. Why do you think I said this looks like fun? He chuckled. Only taking on 15 of those fuckers is an easy day in the office at this point. We are living the life, aren't we? She grinned. I get to spend my days hanging out with the South Texas wrestling champion, busting heads together. He puffed out his chest. So from my point of view, you're damn right I'm living the life. She laughed. Good to know I'm having a positive impact on your life. So how do y'all want to handle this? Carter piped up. What you thinking, girl? Rufus asked. Let's see, she said. It's a four-lane road, so we have some room to work with. What do you think about doing a double barricade? Trucks side by side, cop car up front to break them up? Rufus asked, miming the motion with his hands. And we just pick them off from the bed? These things don't seem to be able to climb that well, Sparks said. So we should be pretty safe in the truck bed. Just to be safe, we should have somebody on climber duty, he replied. Given you have a shotgun, I think that should be you. She raised her eyebrows in mock offense. You want to put me on cleanup duty? Think of it like a vacation day, girl, he winked at her. I think you've earned one. I think we all have, she agreed. Carter raised his hand. Sorry, I didn't quite follow that. What are we doing? Deputy, Spark said, turning to him. I want you to pull your car up about 20 feet and park it across the center lanes. Ricky and I are gonna line our trucks up behind you, and we're gonna climb into the truck beds. When we're set, you're gonna hit the siren to get their attention. Carter swallowed nervously. You want them to run at us? It's a lot safer to attack them from a fortified position, she explained. And besides, we don't exactly have sniper rifles, so it's gonna be a little difficult to pick them off from here. He shook his head in disbelief, and then trudged back to his car. Okay, Ricky, line them up, Sparks said, jumping back into her truck. They parked about 10 feet behind the cop car, parallel across the road with the beds touching to form a large platform. Ricky, Mary, you take the right, she instructed as the five of them climbed up. Jeff, Rufus, the left. I'm gonna take center position in case any of these fuckers decide they wanna climb. And remember, y'all, Ammo is precious, so don't go shooting off until they are right up on you, Rufus added. All right, deputy, hit the siren, Sparks called. He reached for the button and then paused, taking a deep breath. He hit the automatic locks first. A round of chuckles rippled through the group. Any time there, Bubba, Ricky said, and Carter glared at him through the back window as he flicked the siren. The wail reverberated across the roadway, and the zombies tore towards them immediately. Wait for it, Sparks said, as the zombies tore around the cop car to slam into the truck beds. Light him up, she screamed, and her companions lined up their shots and fired, easily hitting their targets. Sparks continued to aim around, making sure none of the creatures gained a foothold. A little help here, Carter yelped his voice muffled through the car as a pair of zombies pounded on the sides of the cruiser. 
Sparks jumped down to the road with Jeff and Rufus, holding up three fingers and counting down. When she got to zero, both men fired, dropping the zombies in tandem. What the fuck? Rufus asked, motioning to the remaining zombies, slowly shuffling towards them from the big rig. They'd barely made it 15 feet since the siren blared. Shouldn't they be running at us? I encountered a couple of these slowpokes yesterday, Sparks replied. I thought they may have taken a bullet or something, but with this many of them, it has to be something else. Carter unrolled his window. They're starting to break down, he said. What do you mean? Jeff asked. A couple of days ago, we were taking a group down to Sonora when a pack of those things started following us down the interstate, the deputy said, and carefully exited the car. One of the passengers was a doctor who suggested we let them keep pace with us to see if they would tire out. They sprinted at full speed for about 20 miles when they began to slow down, so we decreased our speed to let them keep up. They still moved with the same intensity, but couldn't run nearly as fast. By the time we got close to Sonora, they were moving like these guys here. After we took them out, the doc did a quick autopsy and found that their muscles were shredded. Great, so all we gotta do is get these fuckers to run a marathon and life will be peachy, Rufus said. Well, we can set up a zombie fun run in a bit. Jeff cocked his gun. First, we need to take care of our current problem. Hold up, save your ammo, Sparks said. Hey, Ricky, you got some crowbars in that truck of yours? He knelt down and rummaged in his toolbox. Yeah, I got you covered. He hopped down and handed Sparks and Jeff each a crowbar. Let's get in some cardio, she grinned. Y'all have fun, Rufus waved them off. If it's all the same, I'll keep my gun handy in case they get unruly. Sparks patted him on the shoulder and then stepped forward with her skinhead companion towards the shambling dead. I'll take left, you take right, Jeff said. She nodded. Yep. Jeff reached a zombie first, a youngish looking man missing several chunks of flesh from his arms. The skinhead violently drove the tip of the crowbar through its eye socket, and the corpse fell to the asphalt. This seems to be pretty effective, Sparks said with a grunt, as she caved in another zombie's head with a forceful smack. What do you think, Jeff? Kind of wishing I had stretched first, he replied as he ripped his crowbar out of another zombie's temple. But other than that, yeah, it's good. The duo continued to dispatch the mini horde until a shot rang out, startling them both. Jeff turned quickly to see Rufus playfully blowing smoke from his gun. What the hell was that? That fucker was getting a little too close to my girl there, the older man replied. The skinhead raised an eyebrow at the corpses littering the ground. I'm pretty sure she had it under control. Frankly, I'm glad to know my guardian angel here doesn't take any chances with my safety, Sparks replied giving Rufus a coy smile. He nodded, and I never will. She patted his shoulder again on her way to the truck. So what do you think, boys? Want to see the spoils from this battle? Here's hoping it's more than baby clothes and DVDs, Jeff replied as he and Rufus threw open the doors. Fun fact, the older man said with a lazy grin. If you deep fry canned meat, then smother it in ketchup. It tastes just like steak. Sparks snorted as she peered around him, eyeing up the pallets and pallets of canned goods in the truck. Well, provided you've downed half a bottle of whiskey before dinner, he added. The redhead shook her head and turned to Carter. What do you think, deputy? She asked. Have we earned our keep? More than you know, he replied, mouth agape at their fortune. I'll call in the tow truck while we head back to the shelter. Chapter six. The group passed a scowling Officer Sam's as they entered the shelter, guns in hand. Sparks led the way this time, Carter trailing in last. Sheriff Hutch had his back turned, chatting with some people in the corner. Hey, Sparks, glad you're back. Hutch turned and greeted them. I have some people I'd like you to meet. He stepped aside to reveal three men in militia fatigues. 
Elijah smirked at Sparks and crossed his arms as the group froze. It's a godsend that they showed up, Hutch continued. We need all the trained men we can get. Sheriff Hutch, the redhead said firmly. Please, step back. Is, he realized the tension between the two groups and stepped towards Carter, off to the side. Is there a problem here? Oh, no problem here, Sheriff, Elijah drawled, spreading his arms. It's just that the lady here goes wild for a man in uniform and couldn't stand it when I deflected her advent. His tirade was cut short by a shotgun slug blowing his face off. The civilians dove for cover as his body collapsed, face a bloody goulash of bone and brain matter. Hutch put up his hands and stepped forward as the redhead's group raised their weapons. Somebody want to tell me what the hell that was all about? He asked. These men murdered our friends, Sparks replied, not taking her eyes off of the remaining militia members. Slaughtered innocent men, women, and children, simply because they were in the way. One of the militia members clenched his jaw, remembering the fiery redhead before him. Please, ma'am, I- She cut him off by chambering another shell. The next word out of your mouth will be your last. Okay, Sparks, I'll tell you what, Hutch cut in. If you put down the weapon, I'll escort these men from the building and send them on their way. She glared at them. It's your play, girl, Rufus said quietly. Whatever you want to do, I'll back it. There was a pregnant pause, and then Sparks lowered her shotgun. Sheriff Hutch, get these assholes out of here before I change my mind. Hutch motioned to the cluster of officers rubbernecking in the doorway. Come on, boys, probably best if you go with Officer Sam's here. Sir, where should I escort them to? Sam stepped forward. Take them to my brother in Sonora. Wait a goddamn minute, Rufus snapped. They need to find someplace else. Let me finish. Hutch held up a hand. Officer Sam's, take them to my brother in Sonora and tell him these men need to be put on special duty. Yes, sir, the officer replied. Come on, fellas. He led them away, and the sheriff turned back to the group. If they are there when we arrive, I'm going to shoot them on sight, Sparks informed him, fists clenched. Calm down and let me explain, Hutch said, voice frustratingly calm. They're going to be put on special duty, which means they will be sent out into the wasteland to gather supplies. The only time they will be in town is to drop off goods and get their next assignment. It's a hard life, and based on the last week, it has a very short life expectancy. I meant what I said, Sparks told him, as she stepped right up to his face. If I see them again, they're going to meet the same fate as their leader here. Fair enough, he replied. When you get to Sonora, please feel free to relay that info to my brother. Deputy Carter will back you up. Sparks nodded. Thank you, Sheriff. If you'll excuse me, I need to make some final preparations for this group to get on the road, he said. If you'd like, you can leave your trucks here and ride with them on the bus. Yeah, that ain't happening, cowboy, Rufus said. Fair enough, the sheriff replied. Y'all should get packed up then so you can follow the bus out to Sonora. We'll be ready, Jeff assured him. Hutch put a hand on Carter's shoulder as he walked away. Deputy, a word? Rufus turned to Sparks as their group huddled up. God damn, girl, you are cold-blooded. Nah, if I was cold-blooded, those other three wouldn't have walked out of here, she replied. Speaking of them, Jeff piped up. What do you think about the sheriff and his special duty bullshit? I think you summed it up pretty well there, Rufus agreed. Sparks, what do you think? That we should hope for the best, but prepare for the worst, she said. The reality is, we don't have much in the way of supplies, and there's not a whole lot past Sonora until you get close to El Paso. So it's either we play nice in Sonora or we starve? Ricky threw his hands up. Rufus scowled. Seems to be about the long and short of it. We aren't going in without a plan, though, Sparks cut in. Ricky, how's your truck doing? Still going strong, he said. She's a tough old girl. Good, because we're all piling into it, the redhead replied. Mary put a hand on her hip. 
Strength in numbers, huh? Yep, Sparks confirmed. And we need to be prepared for anything. So make sure your weapons are topped off and your trigger fingers itchy, Rufus instructed. She nodded. All right, let's get loaded up. Chapter 7 Sparks and Rufus leaned on the roof of Ricky's truck from the bed, the other three getting situated inside as the tour bus loaded up. Sparks, Rufus, you guys about ready to hit the road? Sheriff Hutch asked as he strolled up with Carter in tow. The redhead nodded. We're ready whenever you are. I was wondering, he said as he shifted his weight on his left hip. Could you give my deputy here a ride? The two companions glanced at each other, and Rufus sighed. Eh, what the hell, climb on up, he said. Carter, the sheriff patted his comrade on the back as he hoisted himself into the truck bed. Be sure to introduce Sparks and her friends to my brother. Yes, the deputy stammered. Yes, sir. All right, Hutch nodded. I'm gonna give some parting words to the tour group, then get you on your way. Hey, sheriff, Sparks called. He turned and looked up at her, tipping his hat. Yes? Where's the big rig we helped you rescue? She asked. Thought it was going to be headed this way, too. It's gonna be an hour or so behind you, he told her. We just got it back to the truck stop and wanted the mechanic to give it a once over. Last thing we want is for it to break down on us. Well, you know, she said. Ricky is a hell of a mechanic. He can take a look at it if you like. Oh, don't worry, we have everything under control. Hutch smiled and put his hands up. Y'all have done enough. Get to Sonora, kick back, and settle into your new home. Sparks nodded and returned his smile. Thanks, Sheriff, I appreciate it. Y'all have safe travels, Hutch replied, and waved as Carter settled in against the tailgate. Thanks for your help up here. Rufus nodded. Our pleasure. The sheriff climbed into the tour bus, grabbing the microphone to address his refugees. Folks, if I can have your attention, please, he began. I know that this has been a very trying week for everyone. We've all faced unimaginable terror, losing our family and friends as well as our homes. But fate has led you to my doorstep, and now that you're here, I'm going to take care of you all. There was a round of applause and some hoots, and he extended his hand to wave them calm. Thank you, but that's really not necessary, he said. I'm just doing what anyone in my position would do. Now, my brother has Sonora safe and secure, and has a new house set aside for you. Granted, some of you may have to have some roommates for a while, but everybody here is friendly, right? There was a louder round of applause this time, with yells to the affirmative. That's the spirit, y'all, he cried. All right, kick back and enjoy your leisurely drive to your new home. Driver, just follow that nice officer in front of you, and he'll get you to where you need to go. Hutch handed the mic back to the driver and exited the tour bus as the passengers whistled and clapped in excitement. Off we go, Sparks muttered as everyone started their engines. Chapter 8 Sparks and Rufus leaned against each other as the convoy sped down the interstate, backs against the cab of the truck. They watched Carter, who watched the cruiser following them. I can't tell if he's signaling them, or if he is just wondering what he did so wrong to have to ride with us, the redhead said into her companion's ear. All I know is, if anything ain't right in town, that motherfucker dies first, Rufus declared. You caught his stuttering too, Sparks asked. When the sheriff gave him his orders? Like I said, he replied. I would have given anything for him to be in one of my card games. The truck slowed as they approached their exit, and two armed officers moved their cruisers out of the way on the ramp. They returned to defensive positions once the convoy passed through and turned right towards the northern part of town. Any idea where we're headed? Rufus asked loudly. Looks like a lot of the houses are the other way. Don't worry, Carter turned to him, but avoided eye contact. We're headed to the airport to get everybody processed. Rufus pursed his lips. Uh-huh. Sparks nudged him to discreetly look at a side street filled with cars sustaining major damage. 
She got to her knees and stuck her head into the back window of the cab as Rufus leaned forward to distract the deputy. So looks like y'all have a hell of a traffic jam over there, he said, motioning to the side street. Well, you know, Carter laughed nervously. Maybe they were having a block party. Rufus raised an eyebrow. Uh-huh. Sparks resumed her sitting position, and the older man turned to her. How are they doing up there? He asked. Oh, you know, she smiled, just anxious to get settled into their new home. A moment later, the engine revved loudly, and the truck slowed to a crawl. Carter clenched his fists as he saw the bus pulling away towards the airport hangars. Come on, guys, we gotta catch up to the others, he said, a hint of panic in his voice. Relax there, Sparky, Rufus waved at him. It's a small town, we'll catch up easily. Carter wrung his hands. Yeah, but shh, it's fine. Rufus put his finger to his mouth. Sorry, y'all, Ricky called back through the window. She does this from time to time, just give me a minute. His revving was suddenly drowned out by the sound of gunfire, and Sparks and Rufus jerked their heads around to see the tour bus being torn to shreds by bullets. They whipped around, just in time for Carter to stand up and draw his weapon. But the redhead was quicker, and she kicked him square in the chest. He hit the asphalt hard on his neck, and Rufus opened fire on the windshield of the cruiser behind them, blood splattering the insides of the windows. Ricky, get us the fuck out of here, Sparks screamed, and the vehicle lurched forward violently. Rufus grabbed her around the waist and threw them down on the truck bed softening her fall with his body. You okay, girl? He asked into her ear. She nodded. Yeah, you? You know me, he replied with a chuckle. I like it rough. Bullets ricocheted off of the side of the truck as Ricky made a hard turn onto a side street. A tire blew, and he swerved violently from side to side, but he managed to make it a few blocks before he couldn't make it any further. Everybody out, we gotta move. Sparks yelled, her and Rufus leaping over the side of the back. The others piled out of the cab, and Jeff busted through the gate of a privacy fence, huddling around the back of a house in tense silence. Sparks knelt down, staring off into space, looking near catatonic. Mary broke away from the guy standing guard to sit beside her. Sparks? She asked gently. Are you okay? No response. I think we're clear, Jeff said quietly after a few minutes, at least for the moment. Yeah, we got nothing from this side either, Ricky added from the other side of the house. Rufus knelt down in front of the redhead. How's she doing? He asked. Still not speaking, Mary replied, worrying at her lower lip. Sparks, you hanging in there, girl? The older man searched her face for any kind of recognition. We're in a bit of a situation, and we could use you right about now. He reached out and squeezed her bicep, cocking his head. Hun, what can I do? She tilted her head at this, steely gaze meeting his. We're gonna kill them all. Her voice was low and deadly. There's my girl, Rufus declared, and took a step back as she got to her feet. This has gone on long enough. Her voice rose in volume as she paced back and forth in front of her teammates. The strong, preying on the weak, innocent people just trying to survive another day, only to be cut down by gun-toting hillbillies, hiding like cowards because they can't find their balls with a goddamn electron microscope. Well, no more. This ends right fucking now. I am going to cleanse this town like a goddamn biblical plague. I don't know if my life expectancy can be measured in hours, days, or months. All I know is that I'm going to spend the rest of my time protecting innocent lives and murdering every last goddamn motherfucker that even contemplates doing harm to them. She stopped pacing, took a deep breath, and looked to Rufus. I could use a hand. The older man raised his arm like a schoolboy. Can I loot the dead? If you see something you like, then by all means, it's yours, the redhead replied with a shrug. He grinned. All right, I'm in. Sparks, Jeff said reluctantly. I know you're upset over Principal Dan and the group, 
but we have no idea how many men we're up against. Mary nodded. Shouldn't we just cut our losses and get out while we can? I'm not asking y'all to come with me, Sparks declared. I know you see this as a suicide mission, but I don't. I became a police officer because I wanted to help people. And now after all this time, I finally have that chance. In all honesty, this is the first time I've really felt like myself since this whole thing began. At the very least, I'm going to make some of them pay for what they've done. All right, Ricky agreed. We're with you in spirit and all, but Mary and I ain't exactly equipped for all-out war, you know? But if there's something we can do to help, we'll do it. Rufus grinned. Any of y'all know how to drive one of them big rigs? My daddy drove a route for years and showed me a thing or two. Mary nodded. As long as you aren't having me parallel park, I should be okay. What are you thinking, Rufus? Sparks asked. Well, while the two of us purge this town of douchebags, these three can hijack that truck full of food that's on its way, he replied, squaring his shoulders. Yeah, I guess it wouldn't do us much good to get further west if we don't have basic supplies, Jeff agreed. I think we can handle that. How in the hell are we gonna hijack that big ass thing? Ricky exclaimed. We take out the two cops at the exit ramp, Mary replied, mischief in her eyes. They had it blocked off when we came in. We pose as them, stop the truck on the interstate, and we're good to go. Her husband threw his hands up. And what happens if they have an escort? Wouldn't be the first shootout we've been in today, Jeff shrugged. When you get the truck, I want you to drive 100 miles west, then stop at the next exit, Sparks instructed. If Rufus and I survive the day, we'll be there by dawn. If we don't, then I hope you guys find some peace and quiet. Come on now, don't talk like that, the skinhead said, putting his hands up. You've walked away from a lot worse this week. Y'all got this. Thanks for the vote of confidence, she replied with a chuckle. Go on, y'all need to book it to the exit ramp if you're gonna catch that truck. Jeff nodded and moved towards the gate. Ricky peeked out through the slats and then quickly shut it, ducking back in. What is it? The skinhead asked. Ricky put a finger to his lips. It's a patrol. The group crowded around the gate, and Sparks peeked out before turning towards her companions. Okay, when I give the signal, I want you three to take off running, she said. Ricky furrowed his brow. Are you crazy? Trust me, she replied. They might get off a panic shot, but they won't get off any more. Rufus and I will be sure of that. Ricky scrubbed his hands down his face. God damn it. You take left, I got the right, Sparks said to Rufus, as the trio prepared to sprint for their lives. The older man raised an eyebrow. And the center? First come, first served, she said. Rufus grinned. It's on, then. Sparks watched the patrol as they carefully moved closer, and when they hit the 20-yard range, she tapped Jeff on the shoulder. The trio burst from the gate, startling the guards into jumping back before even thinking about raising their weapons. As they took aim, one took a bullet in the head, the other in the stomach. The third barely opened his mouth before two bullets blew through his chest. Pretty sure mine hit first, Rufus said. Sparks punched his arm lightly. You better get your eyesight checked, old timer, because I think it's fading quick. Check the score, sweetheart. My guy's dead while yours is still wiggling around, he teased as they strolled out through the gate. I wanted to ask him some questions, so I adjusted my aim. Sparks feigned offense at his insinuation. Rufus rolled his eyes. You sure you weren't one of them slick politician types instead of a cop? Cause that's some next level bullshit right there. All right, you got me, she laughed. But you have to admit that my bad aim paid off. That it did, girl, he agreed as they reached the moaning cop. Now let's ask this sumbitch some questions, shall we? Sparks knelt down beside their victim as Rufus kicked his gun away. How you doing there, bud? She asked. Looks like you hurt yourself a bit. He simply moaned, clutching his stomach as blood puddled beneath him. Yes, I know it hurts, she said, but you really need to suck it up and listen to what I have to say. Please, I, he hissed, I have a family. And if you ever want to see them again, you need to pay attention, 
she demanded. Now I'm going to make this as simple as I possibly can. You answer my questions, and my friend and I will be on our way. You refuse, and, well, she drew her knife, holding the blade up near his face. I'm going to jam this thing through your eye socket and twist it until you stop moving. Do you understand? He nodded furiously, eyes wide. Good, she said. So, let's start with your name. It's, he gulped, it's Mitchell. See, that wasn't so hard, was it? Sparks wiggled the knife. Now how many men do you have? There are, he coughed, spitting blood all over the sidewalk. There are a few dozen or so up by the airport. We, we took over the hangars and made it a base. She cocked her head. Is that where your family is? No, he hissed. The families are in the south of town. Families? Sparks raised an eyebrow. How many are there? He shrugged and then coughed again. Forty, maybe fifty women and children. Jesus Christ, she snapped. If you're protecting families, then why did you assholes murder that bus full of people? Because that, Mitchell gasped. That's what the sheriff demanded. He puts his people first, and we need the supplies. So that means the rest of us have to die? She lashed out and grabbed his throat and squeezed, causing him to sputter as his face turned bright purple. She finally let him go, and he gasped and hacked, adding to the pool of blood beneath his head. It's nothing personal, he wheezed. Rufus barked a laugh. As you can tell, we sort of took it that way. The sheriff came around when this all started and gave us an ultimatum, Mitchell croaked. Join him, and our families would be safe. Anybody who refused was executed, and their families were taken to the hospital. Sparks clenched her fists. This maniac attacked the families? No, he locked them in the hospital, he replied. Rufus furrowed his brow. What's in the hospital? Zombies, and lots of them, Mitchell hacked. As soon as the first person turned, the sheriff locked it up tight to contain it. When people don't cooperate, they're forced inside. So you selfish maniacs have murdered hundreds of innocent people? Sparks took a deep breath. We did it for our families, he wailed and coughed violently again. What would you do to protect your family? She raised her knife. You're about to find out. Hold up there, girl. I got a question for old Mitchell here. Rufus interrupted. She lowered her arm. Okay, go for it. Who were the 13 Vietnamese generals involved in the Tet Offensive? The older man asked. Mitchell hissed in pain. How the hell would I know? All right, carry on, girl, Rufus said with a wave of his hand. Sparks slammed the knife down into the side of their victim's head, and his body twitched violently for a moment before falling still. She ripped out the blade and wiped the brain matter off of it on the corpse's shirt. Okay, I'll bite, she said as she stood up. What the hell was up with the Vietnam question? Well, you said if he answered your questions, you'd let him go, Rufus replied with a shrug. So I asked him something he wouldn't know. You're a lot of things, but a liar ain't one of them. Just wanted to, you know, protect your honor. Sparks stared at him for a moment, and then swallowed hard. You know, for a tough old bastard, you can be a big old softy. Only with certain things, he replied with a wink, and leaned down to grab ammo from the fallen cops. We should get moving, she holstered her knife. Rufus nodded as he pocketed the ammo. Agreed, south part of town? She nodded. Lead the way. Chapter Nine The hijacking trio crept up the road towards the exit ramp. I'm really worried about Sparks, Mary said quietly. Ricky squeezed her arm gently. Ah, uh, baby, don't worry. She's just blown off some steam after a rough couple of days. By murdering an entire town full of people, she raised an eyebrow. Jeff shrugged. I mean, it's not like they don't deserve it. I know, Mary replied biting her lip, but she's just different. 
I wish we could have convinced her to come with us and escape. I don't want anything to happen to her. Don't worry, babe, she's a tough girl, her husband assured her. Jeff nodded. And Rufus will do anything to protect her, too, he added. She'll be fine. They reached the base of the exit ramp and knelt down in the bushes, peering at the two officers about 60 yards away with their backs turned. All right, there they are, Jeff said. How you want to do it? Ricky asked. The skinhead shook his head. Terrain is too rough on the side of the road, so flanking them really isn't an option. They'd hear us coming. Don't think any of us is a good enough shot to hit them from here, Ricky worried, let alone hitting both of them. They aren't even looking this way, Mary motioned flippantly, lips pursed. Why don't we just walk up on them and do, do what needs to be done? The guys glanced at each other and shrugged. That's just crazy enough to work, Ricky said. Good job, baby. All righty then, Jeff agreed. Walk softly, guns out, and nobody fires until you're within 10 feet. Mary put up a hand, or they turn our way. That too, the skinhead agreed. Ricky checked his handgun and stood. Well, here goes nothing. They spread out across the ramp, marching in unison, stride for stride. They were careful not to stomp or drag their feet. But at the 15-foot mark, one of the officers caught a glimpse out of the corner of his eye. What the hell? He blurted, but before he could even draw his weapon, bullets riddled the pair. The corpses hit the ground, and the guys double-checked to make sure they were really dead. Everybody good? Jeff asked. Ricky nodded. Peachy. I, Mary stammered. I'll live. Baby, you okay? Her husband furrowed his brow. She nodded. I'll be fine, just not a fan of all this killing. I know. He rubbed her shoulder, but this is an us or them situation. She nodded again. I realize that, doesn't mean I have to like it. Guys, Jeff cut in, we'll have plenty of time to talk this out, but right now we need to hide the bodies and get changed into their uniforms. What the fuck? Ricky blinked at his comrade. I ain't wearing that. Gonna have to if we wanna take the truck by surprise, the skinhead replied. If they don't see two cops standing here, they'll just drive right over us. Babe, I shot a man in the back so we could get the truck, Mary said firmly. You're gonna put that uniform on, or you're gonna be sleeping on the couch whenever we find a place that actually has one. Ricky sighed. Yes, dear. They got to work stripping the officers as she walked over to the closest cruiser. She opened the passenger side door and sat down facing the interstate. She swallowed and blinked rapidly a few times, but couldn't stave off the sob that tore its way from her throat. Babe, you okay? Ricky called. She furiously wiped at her eyes and took a deep breath. Yeah, hon, I'm okay, just gonna keep watch for the truck. Chapter 10 Rufus knelt to wait as a patrol car drove by. See anything, girl? Sparks peered through the window of the house they were hiding behind. Thrift store furniture and a bit of a mess, she said. Not sure something went down in there, or if they just aren't good housekeepers. Well, I'll feel right at home then, he replied. She patted his shoulder. Oh, wait, I see a couple of deer heads on the wall, she said. Could be some guns in the house. That's good, because if there's 30 of these fuckers, we're gonna need a little more firepower, Rufus said. She took out her knife and jimmied the window open before looking down at him. Can you give me a boost? Because I'm a gentleman, he said with a grin. I won't attempt to turn that dirty. He turned and cupped his hands together. Ah, don't go soft on me now, old timer, she replied and planted her foot in his hands. He lifted her up, and she dove through the window, landing in a crouch, knife drawn. She waited. When she didn't hear any movement, she walked to the back door and unlocked it to allow Rufus entry. Help me with the chair, she whispered as he gently closed the door behind him. They dragged the heavy recliner in the living room over as a makeshift barricade in the living room door. Once it was wedged into place, Rufus banged loudly on the doorframe. 
A tall teenage zombie tore around the corner, bloody torso hitting the back of the chair and flipping her forward. Rufus drove his blade into the back of her skull. Well, that worked better than expected, he said. Sparks nodded and banged on the doorframe a second time. Just to be sure, she said. This time, there was no response. If it's all the same, he readied his knife. I'll do a pass through the house for any other threats. I'll see if there's anything left in the cupboards, she replied. They parted, and Sparks headed into the kitchen to riffle through the cabinets. She tossed a box of crackers onto the counter and found a pitcher of sweet tea in the fridge. House is clear, Rufus said as he entered the kitchen. Looks like some shit went down in the back, but nothing's moving. How's it look in here? How does crackers and tea sound? She asked. He shrugged. A little too British for my liking, but hell, not gonna complain at this point. Don't worry, it's sweet iced tea, she assured him and laughed. Although the mental image of you with a teacup is amusing. He wagged a finger at her. Hey now, I can raise my pinky just as good as anybody. Hopefully we live long enough for me to see that, she replied. Speaking of which, he said, any idea how you want to go about slaughtering this town? She scratched the back of her head as she picked up a sleeve of crackers. Yeah, that's a bit of a pickle there. We have a few dozen people holed up in a fortified position, and I'm not sure we even have 50 bullets between us. Plus, based on the firepower that took out the bus, they ain't fucking around, Rufus added as he poured the tea into two glasses. Hey, when you cleared the house, did you see any weapons? She asked. He nodded as he lifted his glass. Gun cabinet in the back bedroom. Looked like there were a few hunting rifles in there. Don't know how much ammo. Well, let's go check that out, she said as she clinked her glass against his. They took a deep draft, and then Rufus wiped his whiskers with the back of his wrist. You got an idea? I always have an idea, she replied. The question is whether it's a good one or not. They each took a handful of crackers and headed back to the bedroom. The walls were covered in blood, but there were no corpses. Sparks ignored the untold horror and crossed to the gun cabinet. Well, that's a good sign, she said, noting the three hunting rifles with scopes. Rufus opened the bottom door, revealing a few boxes of ammo. And that's an even better sign. How good are you with one of these? She asked, popping a cracker into her mouth. Hunting rifle? He straightened his shoulders. Pretty damn good, girl. After the war, I'd go hunting several times a year with my dad. Nothing fancy, just deer and the occasional hog. Something about sitting in that deer blind, just waiting for a shot was so damn calming. She nodded. Yeah, I've heard where it's therapeutic for some war vets. I was in the academy with a few guys who were in Iraq. They said just being up there helped them cope with their memories. Don't know about them boys, but for me, just being camped out with a gun in my hand, knowing that there wasn't some chicken shit sniper aiming at my forehead did the trick, he replied and shook his head. Sparks sighed and brushed the cracker crumbs from her hands before pulling a rifle from the cabinet. Well, guess we're both chicken shits, because we're about to snipe the fuck out of these boys. Well, it's different now, Rufus said. She furrowed her brow. How so? We're the ones doing the sniping. He pointed to his chest and then grinned. Plus, look at us, we're fucking awesome. Sparks chuckled. That we are, old timer, she said, that we are. So girl, Rufus said after finishing off his own crackers. Not trying to rain on your parade there, but just being snipers sounds like half a plan. Pretty sure after the first shot rings out, they're gonna be diving for cover. Well. She turned to face him completely. You know how you said you wanted to blow shit up? His eyes lit up like a kid at Christmas. I'll take that as a yeah, she said with a laugh. Oh, hell yeah, girl, he confirmed, gaze blazing. What you want? She shrugged. That hillbilly dynamite seemed to do the trick last time. Well, not sure I'm gonna be able to find fertilizer, he admitted. But don't despair, my dear. I'm pretty sure I can find the stuff to make a redneck rattler. Sparks cocked her head. 
Think it'll be strong enough to take out a door and something big like a car? Goddamn, girl, you know how to party. Rufus's smile showed all his teeth. What you thinking? These assholes turned a hospital full of people into zombies, she said, fire in her eyes. I feel like those poor souls would like a word with them. He nodded. Give me 20 minutes, and we can go arrange a meet and greet they'll never forget. Chapter 11 Rufus wedged a long metal PVC pipe into the door handle of the hospital front doors. Sparks watched him from the second floor about six houses down, through the scope of one of the rifles. He ran back to her, and she relaxed a little when he reached the front door. Grab me a drink on your way up, she called down from her window. He saluted up at her. Yes, dear. She chuckled and took stock of the hospital through her scope. Not a single window was empty. The building seemed jam-packed full of zombies. Hope you like room temperature light beer, Rufus said as he entered the room. Sparks shrugged. Something, something, beggars, choosers. My thoughts exactly. He chuckled and took a seat at the window next to her. He lifted his rifle to take a look at the hospital himself. So, we had any action? Whole lot of nothing, she replied. How's the timer looking? He checked his watch. Four, maybe five minutes on the decoy, he said. Ten minutes on the party favor. So, while we have this calm, she rolled the words around in her mouth as she turned to him. You mind if I ask you something? He smiled. Hun, you can ask me whatever you want. Why did you want to come along on this suicide run with me? She asked. I mean, please don't take this the wrong way. I'm eternally grateful you're here with me. But just curious why you didn't hesitate. Well, when a pretty girl asks you to murder enough people to fill a dump truck, it's just plain ungentlemanly to decline, he drawled, and she couldn't help but crack a smile. He sighed. I'll be honest, girl. Ever since I saw you use a cowbell to gash open Billy Ray Dudek's forehead to win the championship belt, I knew you were a special woman. She winked. Special is certainly one word for it. I'm serious, he insisted. You are a special lady. You know, when this world went to shit, I was ready to call it a day. Locked away in my shop, feet propped up, and enough whiskey to drown a kindergarten class. I was good to go. But when you dropped in and invited me along, it gave me a reason to keep on going. When we were driving up to comfort, I made the decision that no matter what you asked me to do, I was gonna be right by your side for it. The last 30 years or so may have been quiet, but by God, I'm gonna go out with a bang. She blinked and turned to gaze at him fully. Well, for what it's worth, after the last few days, I'm gonna tell you something I've never told another human being, male or female. She raised her chin. I want you to officially be my tag team partner. Goddamn, girl, his voice cracked. You gonna make an old man shed a tear. As if on cue, a large explosion racked the block. It was the first of his rattlers wedged into a gas tank, causing a small sedan to go up in flames. Looks like the gods want us to cut out the sentimental stuff and get back to killing, Sparks said. Rufus's eyes sparkled. While we're killing, we need to be thinking up tag team names. I think that can be arranged, she replied with a grin, and they returned to their scopes. Less than a minute went by before a truck pulled up to the hospital, and six armed men jumped out to investigate the flaming car. How long until the party starts, Sparks asked. Rufus looked away from his scope to glance at his watch. Four minutes. Let's give it another minute to see if our honey attracts any more flies, she said, and they watched the men form a defensive position around the truck. One of them walked up to the fiery car and pulled out a walkie-talkie. Douchebag by the car looks like he's in charge, Rufus said quietly. Keep your sights on him, Sparks instructed. If he moves back towards the truck, you drop him. 10-4, he replied. Two more trucks pulled up and five heavily armed men jumped out of each. Well, would you look at that, Rufus said, excitement in his voice. This is gonna be a big ass party. She nodded. Time check? 2.45, he replied. 
The leader wandered back to the center of the trucks, pulling some of the men into a huddle. Looks like they're getting their marching orders, she murmured. Her companion held up his wrist. 2.30 on the clock, he said. Shit, that's a goddamned eternity, she sighed. Okay, as soon as they break the huddle, I want you to take out the leader. Hopefully that will keep them pinned down there until the other guests arrive. I can just wing them if you want, he offered. Tie up a couple of them boys as they drag him to safety. Good call, she agreed. And once the firefight begins, focus on their trucks. We need to make sure they don't have a getaway vehicle. The huddle let out a whoop, as if to signify the beginning of a hunt. Rufus took careful aim at the leader, just off his center mass, so it wouldn't be a kill shot. Here we go. He gently pulled the trigger, and a deafening crack echoed through the neighborhood. The bullet tore through the leader's left shoulder, spraying blood and bullet fragments into the men behind him. The shattered debris dropped two more men to the ground, moaning in pain. The sudden attack sent the remaining men into a panic. A few of them squeezed off a few panic rounds, shooting wild and not knowing where they were aiming for. The rest of the men grabbed their fallen comrades and dragged them behind the trucks. That got them riled up, Spark said. Rufus checked his watch. Just gotta keep them agitated for 90 seconds. Hit the trucks, she instructed. He took aim at the tires of the trio of vehicles, popping off round after round to flatten the tires. The sustained fire gave away their position, and the small army of men began to pepper the house with bullets. Glass shattered, and drywall exploded as Sparks and Rufus hit the ground. They crawled away from the windows and into the hallway. Time? Sparks asked. Rufus flung up his wrist in the drywall dust. 30 seconds. Let's get downstairs, she replied. When that door blows, we're gonna have to move. They jumped to their feet and thundered down the stairs, and Sparks took a few steps towards the back door before she realized Rufus wasn't behind her. Where the hell are you going, she cried. He held up a hand to wave her after him as he headed for the front door. Gotta make sure these motherfuckers stay put. He shot out the bay window in the front, and they fired a few rounds into the trucks. Before their enemies could return fire, the hospital doors blew open, and zombies poured out of the opening like a waterfall. The men immediately turned and opened fire but were quickly overtaken by the horde. One of them managed to get into a truck and start it up. Rufus took aim, but Sparks pushed his arm down. Don't worry about him, she said. Not worth giving our position away to the zombies. He turned to her. If he gets away, he could warn the others. Let him, she shrugged. It doesn't matter if they know we're out here or not. It's not going to change what we're going to do to them. He slung his rifle over his shoulder and they watched as the man drove away on rims, zombies clinging to the side of the truck. You know, now that I think about it, Rufus said, crossing his arms. Letting that boy go to warn his buddies about us might play to our advantage. Sparks raised an eyebrow. How so? Well, how would you react if someone who just shit himself in terror ran up to you yelling about how he just saw a dozen of his friends get shredded by some ghosts? He grinned. She chuckled. And if those militia boys are there too, sharing what we did to them. Goddamn girl, you are so right, he replied. She nodded. We are a lethal pair. It's a damn shame we're gonna murder all of them. He shook his head as they walked towards the back door. Would be kinda nice to go down as legends in the history books. Well, we may just have to leave one of them alive then, she suggested. What kind of tag team partner would I be if I didn't let our legend spread? He clapped her on the back. That's my girl. Come on, let's get out of here before those ghouls finish with their buffet, Spark said, and pushed open the back door. Chapter 12 Hey, Mary. Jeff turned to glance at the cops of trees behind them. You doing okay over there? He shifted his weight and rested his hand on the large uniform belt buckle. Yeah, she replied as she peeked out from the bushes. Just wish this guy would hurry up. The sooner we get up the road, the better I'll feel. 
Don't worry, baby, Ricky assured her as he adjusted his uniform cap. We're gonna get this food and be on our way. We'll be cozying up together while Rufus burns the hell out of some canned meat before you know it. A horn bleated loudly in the distance. Nice of them to give us a heads up, Jeff tensed. Mary nodded. Don't worry, boys, I got your back, she said, and ducked back into the trees. Bubba, this is one terrible idea, Ricky said, voice lowered so that his wife couldn't hear him. You know that, right? His companion scowled. Well, if you had a better one, you should have spoken up earlier. I mean, I didn't, the younger man protested. But damn, wasn't aware this being a bad idea was contingent on me coming up with a better option. You just be ready to draw as soon as they start getting out of the car, Jeff said as the truck came into view. There was a cruiser escorting it, and Ricky nodded, taking a deep, nervous breath. The bald man in disguise stepped forward and waved his hands. The single cruiser crept to a stop, the truck halting right behind it. Hey guys, Jeff yelled. We got some trouble in town here. Can, can you step out so I can fill you in? He didn't see any movement inside the car, and he turned to glance back at Ricky. A shot rang out, shattering the windshield of the enemy car. Ricky tumbled backwards, and Jeff dove behind the closest cruiser. Mary, her husband screamed, gripping his wounded shoulder as he rolled behind the other car. She emerged from the woods with a scream, emptying the entire clip of her assault rifle into the passenger side window of the enemy cruiser. What was left of the enemy officers slumped forward, car horn blaring. She stood motionless, staring at the lives she'd just taken. Tears streamed down her face as she trembled, but the sound of the transport truck shifting into gear knocked her back into reality. She reloaded, dropping the empty mag on the ground and slapping a new one in. She darted to the passenger side of the truck and hopped up to the door, tapping the glass with her gun. Shut it down, she yelled. The middle-aged trucker quickly raised his hands as he hit the brakes. Slowly, and I mean slowly, Mary said as she aimed the gun at him. Put it into park and shut the engine off. As the driver complied, he kept one arm raised, and she tilted her head to hail to the guys. Jeff, cover his exit. The skinhead popped out from behind his cruiser and ran over, gun drawn. Got you covered. Slowly get out and walk to my partner, Mary instructed. He nodded and opened the door, dropping down to the asphalt. As soon as he was in Jeff's custody, she leapt from the truck and skidded around the car barricade to her husband. Baby, you okay? She demanded, gasping at the sight of him laying on his back in a pool of blood. Goddamn motherfucker shot me, Ricky cried, holding his shoulder tightly. Answer me, she screamed. He startled, looking up at her. Yeah, babe, I'm okay, he assured her. It's gonna hurt like a motherfucker, but I'll live. Mary dropped her gun and burst into tears, burying her face into his good shoulder. He wrapped her up with that arm and kissed her temple. It's gonna be okay, baby, he whispered in her ear, letting her sob against him. Please, please don't kill me, the trucker whined as Jeff walked him over. The skinhead looked down at the couple, surveying Ricky's wound. What do y'all wanna do about- Please, I'm not with them, I don't- Jeff cocked the hammer on his revolver, silencing the trucker. As I was saying, what do you all wanna do about him? We've already killed these assholes, Ricky grunted. What's one more? Mary shoved away from her husband, causing him to hiss in pain. No. She stood and faced the trucker, nose to nose. Are you with them? She demanded, and he violently shook his head. Are you going to follow us? No, he croaked, hands high in the air. Jeff, get the keys to that cruiser, she demanded. The skinhead sighed. But just fucking do it, she shrieked, and he tossed her the keys. She held them up and pointed the metal at the trucker's trembling chest. You listen, and you listen good, Mr. Trucker. There's been enough killing for today, hell, for a lifetime. I'm gonna give you the benefit of the doubt here, 
Now you're going to help my man here into the truck, and then you are going to wait patiently while we head out. When we get a little ways up the road, I'm going to stop and drop these keys to the ground. After you watch us vanish on the horizon, you can come get them and gain your freedom. Only rule I have, she held up a finger. Don't follow us. Can you handle that? Yes, ma'am, he stammered. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. All right, all right, that's enough, she snapped. Now go help my man. You sure about this, Mary? Jeff asked as the trucker rushed over to lift Ricky. I'm done killing Jeff, she said, screwing a fist into her tired eye. I, I just can't do this anymore. It's okay, we got the food, he assured her. You did good. We'd be dead if it wasn't for you. I know, and I appreciate the sentiment, she replied. But I don't want to talk about it, okay? Let's just hurry up and get up the road. Chapter 13 Looks like they're holed up in the two furthest buildings, which means it's gonna be a bitch and a half to get to them, Rufus murmured as he peered through the scope of his rifle to survey the airport. Yeah, that kind of eliminates the frontal assault plan, Spark said with a sigh and moved back behind the building they were using for cover. Don't discount that idea too much, he said, and pointed up to a set of speakers on top of the building beside them. We do have reinforcements we can call. I mean, they ain't exactly on our side, but they sure as hell ain't on theirs either. Might be able to split them up a bit too, she replied thoughtfully. How do you feel about taunting? He grinned. Wouldn't be much of a tag team partner if I didn't have my skills now, would I? I knew I picked you for a reason. She nodded with a grin of her own. All right, here's what we're gonna do. Rufus slowly opened the door to the small building, careful not to make a sound as he drew his knife. The room was dark, with a single light source coming from the far side. He ducked down behind a desk, spotting a lone man sitting at the broadcast console with his feet propped up and a bottle of whiskey in his hand. His low baritone formed around an unrecognizable drinking song as his head lolled back and forth. Rufus glided across the floor and lashed out in complete silence, grabbing the man's mouth with one hand and driving his knife into his head with the other. The whiskey dropped, and Rufus used his foot to soften its landing, holding the man until his twitching ceased. The interloper picked up the still half-full bottle and set it on the table beside the console. He crossed to the window and drew the curtain, peeking out to the alley below. He opened the window and then headed back over to the console, picking up the mic. He hit the talk button, sending an echoing shriek through the airport. Good afternoon, murderous douchebags, he greeted. This is your old pal Rufus, here to deliver a public service announcement. Your former friends and neighbors that you relocated to the hospital have been set free. No word on whether or not they have paid your families a visit, but it might be a good idea for you to check on them. Oh, and just in case you wanted to reunite with your old friends, I'm gonna let them know where you are at. He laughed. Get fucked, motherfuckers. He dropped the mic and hit the button for the tornado siren. Rufus grabbed the bottle and hopped out the window as half a dozen armed men burst through the door, guns raised. He shoved a strip of his shirt into the top of the bottle and lit it, chucking the whiskey back into the comm tower. The glass shattered and splashed napalm back on the men, and he tore down the alleyway, screams echoing after him. Sparks watched the front door from across the street, high on the roof of a two-story building. She peered through her scope as two men stumbled outside, dropping to the asphalt in an attempt to put out the flames. She easily popped off two rounds, catching both men before they were finished rolling around. A truck revved in the distance, and she scanned the roadways, readying her aim. A dark blue Hemi sped around the corner, five men piled in the back. Sparks took aim and shot twice into the windshield, shattering it. The truck swerved and smashed into the flaming building, sending bodies flying everywhere. She popped off loud cracking rounds into any of the men that even so much as twitched. 
Rufus climbed up a ladder and crept across the roof, careful to stay out of sight. He peeked across the way to see his red-headed companion doing the same thing on a flanking building. She held up her fist, and he returned the gesture to show he understood to wait. He took stock of the building across from him. There were half a dozen guards out front, guarding two doors. There was movement in the second floor window, but the bars were so close together it would be impossible to get a shot through them. The second building had a lone guard standing by a single door. Everyone was straight-backed and rubber-necked, all on high alert. They tensed even further as the tornado siren abruptly stopped, likely having been taken over by the fire. The silence was almost deafening until low moans permeated the thick air. A few dozen zombies sprinted down the main road, making a beeline for the cluster of guards. They opened fire, but the undead didn't slow in the least. One of the guards panicked and threw open the door to go inside, and Rufus took him down, dropping his body into a perfect door jam. The other guards backed up and tried to get their fallen comrade inside, but Rufus's fire slowed them down enough that the zombie horde was able to overtake the opening. He grinned and gave Sparks a thumbs up. She returned it, and they watched from their respective vantage points as the zombies poured into the building. There were screams and gunshots from within. As the last corpse pushed inside, Rufus darted back to the ladder and slid down to the ground, drawing his handgun as he hit the asphalt. He snaked around to the front of the building, taking stock of the bodies littering the ground. He moved cautiously across the street, keeping his gun trained on the open door. He peeked in. Zombies lined the stairs, trying to reach the survivors on the second floor. Rufus kicked the door jam body inside and slammed it shut, latching it. At Sparks' whistle, he looked up at her, and she signaled for him to cover her. He moved towards the secondary building, holding up a hand. He stood at the corner, keeping an eye on the windows across from her as she moved to her own ladder. One of the windows shattered, and a rifle barrel appeared. Without hesitation, Rufus leapt into the street and unloaded the entire clip of his handgun into the window. The gun slumped and dangled before jerking back inside. He reloaded and kept his gun aimed at that window until Spark stepped up next to him. Did you get him? She asked. Well, I got somebody, he replied. But there's at least one other person in there. No way that asshole was gonna be able to pull that gun back in on his own. What do you say, tag team partner? She grinned. Wanna go introduce ourselves to them? He nodded with a mischievous glint in his eyes. Oh yeah, let's finish it. They jogged over to the door and took positions on either side. He reached over and turned the knob, flinging the door open, but ducking back out to cover. A few shots rang out, but they just hit the swinging door. Rufus peeked inside. There was a single man on the stairs, struggling with his gun. He's reloading, go! He jumped in and fired twice, causing the man to duck down. Spark started in to the left flanking the enemy as Rufus drew his attention to the right. The man finally reloaded and started shooting at the metal shelving that the older man dove behind. Sparks knelt in the opposite corner and took aim, taking out a significant chunk of their opponent's torso with her hunting rifle. Rufus, you good? She barked. He jumped out from behind the shelving. Yeah, that motherfucker couldn't shoot for shit. He brushed himself off as they converged at the base of the stairs, handguns at the ready. Sparks led the way up the stairs, gently nosing open the dark office doors as they moved along the hallway. All of the rooms were clear, until she heard a shuffle behind the door at the end. She held up three fingers and counted down. At zero, she and Rufus burst into the room, ready to shoot. They froze at the sight of a young man cowering in the corner with his hands in the air. He was covered in blood, seemingly the blood of his friend slumped beneath the window. Rufus kicked the kid's rifle away and gave him a pat down. He's clean, he said to Sparks, and then stepped back. You keep your hands where we can see him. Yes, 
Yes, sir, the kid stammered. The older man crossed his arms. What's your name? It's, his voice cracked into a sob. It's Brandon. Rufus nodded. So, Brandon, where's the sheriff? He's next door, the kid replied. The older man cocked his gun. You wouldn't be lying to us now, would you? No, no, Brandon cried. He's in the building next door, I swear. He pointed to the walkie-talkie on the table. He, he just called a minute ago asking for help. Rufus glanced at the table. Did he now? The radio crackled. God damn it, the sheriff yelled through the receiver. Is anybody there? We need assistance. Sparks grabbed the radio. Do you have family here in town? She asked as she walked to the trembling kid. Yes, Brandon stammered. Respond she instructed, and handed him the walkie-talkie. Ask him what his situation is, and just keep in mind that if you alert him to our presence, your family will be our next visit. He took a deep breath and nodded jerkily. This is Brandon, he cleared his throat. What's your situation? Thank fucking Christ, the sheriff replied. We need help, where are you? You can tell him you're next door, Spark said. The kid nodded. I'm right next door to you, sir. Have the intruders been eliminated? Came the reply, and Sparks nodded. Yes, sir, Brandon confirmed. I was able to take them down, but they got the others. Good job, man, the sheriff replied with a sigh. I don't think I know you too well, but after that, I'm gonna promote the hell out of you, son. Now I'm gonna need some help before I can do that, though. You think you're up to it? Brandon took a deep breath. Yes, sir, what can I do? Well, look, son, the sheriff began. There's a few of us trapped in the command office. There's about 30 of those things outside the door, and we can't get through the bars on the window to get out. Now there's some trucks outside the hangar that have some tools in them. You think you can get over there and grab some crowbars or something out of the back? Yeah, I can do that, sir, the kid said. Give me just a few minutes and I'll be right over. That's my boy, Brandon. At the sheriff's triumph, Sparks grabbed the radio and tossed it to Rufus. You did good, kid, she said, and aimed her gun at him. Now, Brandon, this is normally when I would put a bullet in you before being on my way, but I'm not going to do that. He immediately relaxed, tears streaming down his cheeks. Oh, thank you, thank you. Quiet, Rufus put a finger to his lips. The lady ain't done talking yet. Now, just so there's no misunderstanding, Sparks continued. I'm not sparing you out of mercy or because you have a family or any of that nonsense. I'm sparing you because I need you to deliver a message. Sooner or later, Sheriff Hutch from Junction is gonna make his way down here, and it's gonna be your job to convince him to cut his losses and not pursue us. Do you think you can do that? Yes, yes, I will tell him that, Brandon nodded furiously. You're gonna need to do more than simply tell him she emphasized. You're gonna have to convince him to stand down, because if anybody from this town or junction comes within 10 miles of us, my friend and I will come back to finish what we've started. And there will be no mercy next time, no survivors to tell the tale, no more warnings. We will wipe this town and every one of its inhabitants off the face of the earth. Have I made myself clear? Brandon nodded so hard he looked like a bobblehead doll. Yes, ma'am, I will convince him to stand down and you'll never see any of us again. Sparks holstered her weapon. Good boy, Brandon, good boy. Now you're going to sit here and count to a thousand before leaving this room. Think you can handle that? He continued his frenzied nodding and the duo turned to leave. More whiskey? Rufus asked as he picked up a bottle from the table. Man, you guys know how to party, huh? Junction sent us a liquor store truck a couple days ago, so there's been plenty to go around, Brandon piped up. The older man grinned. Well, if that's the case, you won't mind if I take a couple bottles, huh? The truck is parked outside the hangar with the utility trucks, the kid replied. Please, help yourself. I believe we will, Rufus said. You can start counting now. Sparks led the way out of the building as Rufus stuffed a tattered rag into the mouth of the whiskey bottle. The hangar is this way, my dear, he said and motioned to the left. She nodded. Well, let's go get us a truck and get up on out of here. 
Get up on out of here, Rufus laughed. Am I starting to rub off on you, girl? She failed to stifle a smile. Yeah, just a bit, I suppose. Brandon, the sheriff's voice crackled over the radio. How's it coming there, bud? We aren't gonna be able to hold this door forever. Oh yeah, nearly forgot, Rufus said and held out the Molotov. Would you care to do the honors? She took the bottle and bowed her head. It would be my pleasure. She pulled her lighter and set the cloth ablaze, then hucked it up through the window of the zombie-infested building. Brandon, the sheriff cried. What the fuck is going on? Is that smoke? Rufus wiggled the walkie-talkie. Looks like we have our very own radio show to listen to on our drive, he said. Sparks grinned. Sounds like it's going to be interesting. Chapter 14 Ricky's snores gave soundtrack to Mary and Jeff watching the sunset, sitting on the back gate of the transport truck. You doing okay? The skinhead asked, happy to be back in his own clothes as he nursed a lukewarm beer he'd found. She sighed. I told you, I don't want to talk about it. I get it, but if you need it, I have an ear for you, he assured her. Appreciated. She continued to stare up at the stars. You think Sparks and Rufus are gonna make it? Jeff took a long draft of his beer. I've ran in gangs and been in a prison, and I've never met a harder, tougher son of a bitch in my life. And with Rufus backing her up, they are gonna be just fine. He emptied his bottle and then tossed it in the ditch before hopping down to the asphalt. Well, they're warm as shit, but at least they're beer. Can I grab you one? I don't know if I'm in the mood for one, she replied. Trust me, after the day you've had, you need a beer, he said and pointed at her. I'll be right back. Thanks, Jeff, she said quietly and took a deep breath. She caught a glimpse of headlights down the road and grabbed her gun. We have company. He darted back around the truck, weapon drawn, and the two of them raised their guns as the vehicle approached. The headlights flashed twice, and the pickup slowed to a stop about 10 feet away. Rufus hopped out of the passenger's side. What's with the standoff shit? Y'all expecting somebody else? Mary smiled and ran up to give Sparks a hug as the redhead jumped down from the driver's side. Where's Ricky? The police officer asked, eyes wide. He's in the cab, Jeff replied as he patted Rufus on the back. He took a round of the shoulder, but he'll be all right. Yeah, we found some meds in the truck, so I got him bandaged up pretty good, Mary added. Our biggest concern is going to be listening to him bitch about it for the next few weeks while it heals. How did y'all fare? Jeff asked. We have to worry about any retaliation? Rufus shook his head. At the moment, we outnumber them, so I think we should be good. God damn, y'all don't fuck around, do you? The skinhead blinked at the duo. Well, she made me her tag team partner. The older man declared, so I felt obligated to live up to the mantle. Mary raised an eyebrow. Tag team partner? Man, that's awesome, Jeff cried. Y'all come up with a name yet? Sparks winked, leaving that one up to Rufus. You know, I've thought about it, and I think generational kill has a nice cold-blooded ring to it. He grinned and puffed his chest out. She smiled and punched his arm playfully. Generational kill it is then. So with that out of the way, Jeff cut in. Only other question left to answer is, where the hell do we go from here? Should be another exit a few miles up, Sparks replied. We can pull off there and drive down the back roads to see if we can find a place. Almost no population out in these parts, but with some luck, we'll find a spot to call our own. Bound to be someone who wanted to live off the grid. Jeff nodded. Mary, you want to lead or follow? Sparks, I think I speak for everyone when I say, you lead and we shall follow, Mary said, raising her hands. The redhead nodded. All right then, she said. Saddle up and let's go find us a home. Epilogue. Day zero, 9.13 p.m. EST. General Adams sat in his office at the Pentagon and rubbed his eyes. He'd been staring at his computer screen for far too long. He straightened as somebody knocked on the door. Enter, he said. An officer poked his head in. 
sir, there is a John Teeter here to see you? Show him in, Adams replied with a wave of his hand. A short and slight man with graying hair wandered inside and took a seat. Adams, good to see you again, he greeted, voice soft. You too, John, the Joint Chief's head replied. How's civilian life? Loving every last second of it, John smiled. Amazing what I can get accomplished when I don't have 12 layers of bullshit bureaucracy weighing me down. Adam sighed. I'll cut to the chase, he said. I could use your help. Did you miss the part about me enjoying life without bureaucracy? His old friend countered. There's a situation in Austin, the general continued. Eight hours ago, we got word that a bioterrorist potentially launched an attack. In the hours since, we've lost pretty much all contact with the city and the little bit of info we do have doesn't paint a pretty picture. John leaned forward. Tell me what you know. Around 11 a.m. local time, our teams raided the compound, Adams explained. 30 minutes later, the hostile zone protocol was activated. Shortly after that, we lost contact with the team. Boots on the ground? John raised his eyebrows. Eye in the sky? Surely you know something. Local outlets were describing a riot that originated on the UT campus, but shortly after that, they went dark too. Adams replied with a shake of his head. We did a flyover, and it looks like something is going down in the city, but we don't know what yet. There was a sudden commotion in the hallway, complete with lots of shouting. I need to speak with General Adams immediately, a woman shrieked, voice muffled, and the general stood up. What the hell, he muttered, and crossed the office to open the door. The door guards restrained a young woman with wild eyes. She stopped struggling upon seeing Adams. Sir, please, I have info. I told you that the general is busy, one of the guards grunted. What's going on? Adams boomed, and even with his salt and pepper hair, he still pulled rank, and everyone stood at attention. I'm sorry, sir, the private attempted to get into your office, the other guard said quickly. Because I have vital information, she growled. The guard scoffed. File it with your CEO. It's okay, Adam said. Private, what do you have? I think I know what's going on in Austin, sir, she replied. He clenched his jaw. John, walk with us. He waved for his companion to follow her as well, and she led them to a small communications room. She sat down at her post and plugged in a set of headphones. We've been searching for any trace of credible information we can on Austin, but so far we've only found scraps, she said. At first, we thought they were only hoax videos, since it looked like zombies were attacking. Zombies, John blurted. Seriously? Yeah, we said the same thing, too, she replied. It was mostly college kids posting them, so we didn't think anything of it, until I got this. She plugged in a second pair of headphones and handed each of the men a set. This came in on the hostile zone protocol a few minutes ago. We picked it up from a college radio station in San Marcos, which is just south of Austin. It's long, but here's the key part. Three days ago, there was a bioterrorism attack in Austin that sickened a lot of people, a female voice drawled through the earpieces, and has turned them into the zombies that you have no doubt encountered. We don't know a lot about the virus, but I will share what I know. It is airborne, and it targets everyone with an A-blood type. Adams tore off the headphones and pointed to one of the other communication staffers. You, get on the line to the Secret Service. Tell them it's a code red. The rest of you, pack up your things right now. We're headed to the presidential bunker. It's a good call, Adams, John agreed. An airborne virus is nothing to fuck with, even without the zombie side effects. The general nodded. Don't suppose I could convince you to take an impromptu contractor position? We can negotiate my rate later, his friend replied. Just know that I'm not going to put up with any bureaucratic nonsense. Adams clenched his jaw. If this thing is as serious as it appears, I'm counting on you to cut through it. All right, I'm in, John agreed. Good. The general clapped his old friend on the shoulder. I can use your help, since as of right now, it looks like we might be at war. End of book four. Sparks and the gang will return, but the story expands in the new spinoff, Dead America. The series will explore the nationwide response to the zombie outbreak. From the presidential war room to the front lines in major cities and all points in between.